With hill snow likely to end the week, it's going to be rather windy and murky this evening. Britain seeing outbreaks of rain moving east. Ireland and Northern Ireland will see rain giving way to a scattering of showers. Britain is going to see further spells of rain tonight. They'll clear into southern parts later with blustery showers over Ireland and Northern Ireland following to the windy northwest. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. And that's all from the UK tonight. You can catch up on the highlights on our webpage. Just scan the QR code on your screen. Uh, coming up next, it's Yalda Hakim with The World. We'll see you tomorrow. How bold should the West be in standing up to Vladimir Putin? Could the UK ever send troops to Ukraine? The widow of Alexei Navalny says it's time to stop being boring and get tough on Russia. You are not dealing with a politician, but with a bloody monster. On the eve of a major speech by Vladimir Putin, I asked the Prime Minister of Estonia if NATO could put boots on the ground in Ukraine. We should have all options on the table. What more can we do in order to really uh, help Ukraine win? Kaya Kallis has been declared a wanted woman by Russia. I'll ask about the threat to her country and her own life. Plus, I'll be speaking to our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, on the campaign for journalists to get free, unfettered access to Gaza. And we go inside a high-security prison in Ecuador as the military takes control of drugs cartels. That's all coming up on The World with me, Yalda Hecki. Good evening. How do you handle a problem like Vladimir Putin? For over two years, Western countries have slapped Russia down with sanction after sanction. And yet, has anything really changed? Only last week, Sky News exposed how Moscow was gaming the system and still importing weapons from abroad to rearm its war machine. It's little surprise that Ukraine is struggling to hold back the Russian army. So should allies like the UK do more to help? This week, France's president said we shouldn't rule out sending Western troops. The response to the idea of boots on the ground wasn't positive. Not here, not in the United States, not in Russia. 
A close ally of Vladimir Putin today said Macron was acting like Napoleon and trying to start World War III. But that's not to say there isn't support within NATO for stronger action. In a moment, you'll hear from the Prime Minister of Estonia, Kaya Kallis, on why all options should be on the table. First, though, I want to bring you a speech from the widow of Alexei Navalny, at times emotional and at other times critical of the West. Yulia Navalnaya says it's time to stop being boring, think bigger than sanctions and find more creative ways of dealing with the man she called a bloody monster over the death of her husband. The funeral will take place the day after tomorrow. And I'm not sure yet whether it will be peaceful or whether the police will arrest those who have come to say goodbye to my husband. On the one hand, the public murder has once again showed everyone that Putin is capable of anything and, and that you cannot negotiate with him. If you really want to defeat Putin, you have to become, to become an innovator. You, are, you have to stop being boring. You are not dealing with a politician uh, you are not dealing with a politician, but with a bloody monster. Putin must answer for what he has done with my country. Putin must answer for what he has done to a neighboring peaceful country. And Putin must answer for everything he has done to Alexei. My husband will never see what the beautiful Russia of the future will look like. But we must see it. Yulia Navalnaya, the wife of Alexei Navalny, speaking there. So should the West do more to take on Putin and help Ukraine? Well, earlier I spoke to the Prime Minister of Estonia, Kaya Kallas, who told me all options should be on the table. She started, though, by rejecting that claim by Yulia Navalnaya that sanctions aren't hurting the Russian president. Have a listen. We have different uh, areas where we, we force him. I mean, politically isolate him is one, one thing, but also economic sanctions. And I don't buy this Russian narrative that the sanctions are not working. When we see the interest rate of uh, Russian central bank for their economy is 15%, this is how they assess their economy doing. Their budget is in huge deficit. So actually, they want us to believe that it doesn't work and, you know, just lift them. But what I agree with is that we have to also think about the out-of-the-box solutions that will make them uh, reconsider. And one of them is uh, using the frozen assets uh, to the benefit of, of Ukraine. This is something that Russia is definitely afraid of. Well, you'll also know that uh, many are working around the sanctions as well. Yes, granted, yeah. there are the frozen assets, but even here in London, um, we are seeing people working around sanctions. Uh, we had a report on Sky News that we did ourselves about the sort of weapons and the parts making their way to Russia through mm -hmm. third countries. Absolutely. This is, a, this is a great concern. And that's why uh, we have proposed to ban all transits via, via Russia, because very often, you know, the chips or, or technology uh, is, uh, is uh, reported to go to Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan. We don't have the tools to check whether they really reach those countries, but we have big doubts that they're actually uh, not going there, but they're going to Russia. We've also heard uh, from uh, Emmanuel Macron. He is saying that we shouldn't rule out having boots on the ground in Ukraine. Since then, we've had a number of countries, the UK, the US, Germany, come out and push back and say that's not the case. We're not going to have boots on the gr ground in Ukraine. Russia has responded and said that would further escalate things. What's your reaction to everything that's transpired over the last 24, 48 hours around this conversation? Well, first of all, uh, what we decide or discuss behind closed doors uh, should be as open as possible, that we discuss all the possibilities. And what is also important is that everybody is thinking, what more can we do so that Ukraine will win? Because without victory as a goal, we don't achieve anything. So you're uh, not so, ruling uh, out boots on the ground? Do you, you think that uh, Emmanuel Macron was right? 
Well, he didn't propose boots on the ground in a, in a very classical sense, but I think what we have to think is what more can we do and, and what we discuss behind closed doors, uh, we have to be open about this. Of course, we are all democracies and, and there uh, we also have to take into account the public opinion that different countries have. But what I want to stress is that uh, you know, um, we shouldn't be afraid of our own power, which means that Russia, you know, is saying that, you know, this or that step is escalation, where, you know, defence is not escalation. Um, well, so so actually, just to be clear, Prime Minister, you're saying boots on the ground should not be ruled out, that those conversations that are being had behind closed doors should be all options are on the table. Is that what you're saying, including boots uh, on the ground? I'm, I'm saying that uh, we should have all options on the table. What more can we do in order to really uh, help Ukraine win and push back uh, Russia to its borders? Because it's a question of uh, the European security architecture. It's also a question of global security architecture. If Russia wins, we're going to see more wars across the globe. And uh, this is uh, uh, nothing that we want to see. There are discussions about uh, and concerns around uh, America stepping back and Europe potentially being forced to, to step up. There is a conversation around arming Europe that uh, countries like Estonia have woken up to the threat of Russia and say that, you know, we need to be in a position, especially around cyber, uh, to, to be better equipped. There's also a conversation here in the UK uh, around a citizen army. Um, we've had pushback from the chief of the defence, uh, and he said there isn't a threat of going to war uh, with Russia. There isn't a concern around a citizen army. Do you think that is wrong, that, that Europe, the UK, needs to prepare itself for war with Russia? Um, defence is not escalation and, and defence, building your defence forces is also acting as deterrence to Russia. What uh, the aggressor or, or uh, autocrats are provoked by is weakness. So you take up the war if you think you can win and that you take up only when you think you are stronger. That's why I have advocated for really investing more than 2% of, of our GDP to defence. Estonia is doing 3.2% of our GDP, but not all the countries are doing. So I was really surprised when uh, I thought that when the war started in Ukraine two years ago, it would have been a wake-up call to all the European countries to do more, to spend more on defence, to really uh, build defence forces so that they would act as a deterrence, where uh, it hasn't been so. In 2023, it was 11 countries that s spent over 2%. And I don't really understand why, because, you know, in 1988, all the NATO countries spent more than 2% because uh, the threat was real. There was a cold war going on. Now there is a hot war going on in Europe and still uh, not everybody is taking it uh, seriously enough. This is a criticism of Donald Trump. Um, was he right then? Is it fair critique? Um, fair critique is that everybody should do more uh, for, for European defence as well. So I'm just going to push on a couple of um, issues. The first is the concern that uh, Moldova might have uh, around uh, Russia opening a new frontier and, and the worries around a referendum in uh, Transnistria. What are your concerns when it comes to that? Moldova is in a very... A fragile state being uh, uh, in the middle uh, there and, and a small country. So we definitely have to keep them in mind when we are helping Ukraine as well so that they are not left behind. And are you worried about the future of Estonia? We shouldn't be worried. If we are able to help Ukraine to defend themselves, then they're gonna, there are no next or there's not going to be a question who is next. When Russia wins in Ukraine, then we have to worry about uh, NATO being next. Uh, and of course, uh, most recently, Prime Minister, you were put on a Russian wanted list. Are you worried about your safety? No, I'm not. I guess what well, we've seen the way that the Russians have operated, uh, you know, when they have uh, attacked citizens and and people outside of the country, does it not worry you in, in any way, uh, given you're now on this list? Well, um, 
Russia wants to intimidate us. Uh, this is how they operate. Uh, they might want to make me or Estonia afraid and uh, to make us refrain from the decisions that we would otherwise make uh, to, you know, be advocates for supporting Ukraine, the Western unity, everything that really annoys them a great deal. Uh, but I think the response to it is that we shouldn't be afraid uh, and we shouldn't refrain from the decisions that we would otherwise make because this is how, you know, terrorists operate. They want us to be afraid. And the only is, response is that we are, we are not afraid. We act what is, what is right. Prime Minister, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. That was Estonia's Prime Minister Kaya Kallas there on what she says are Russia's attempts to intimidate her and the West. What's the likely reaction? In a moment, we're going to be live in the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, with our international correspondent John Sparks and speaking to our Europe correspondent Adam Parsons, who's in Brussels. Adam, uh, we'll speak to you in just a moment. But first, I, I just wanted to remind people of the comments made by Emmanuel Macron not ruling out Western troops going to Ukraine. Have a listen. There is no consensus today to officially, openly and with endorsement send troops on the ground. But in terms of dynamics, nothing should be ruled out. We will do everything necessary to ensure that Russia cannot win this war. Emmanuel Macron there. I mean, Adam, you know, we heard there from uh, the Estonian uh, Prime Minister Kaya Kallas there, supporting almost in her own way uh, Emmanuel Macron's uh, very bold statements. But there has been backlash. Yeah, it's a really interesting thing because there's a thread, frankly, between Yulia Navalnaya speaking to the European Parliament, Kaya Kallas, who is uh, linked with very big jobs here in Brussels, talking to you, and Emmanuel Macron talking to the world. All of them saying that the West needs to really bolster its approach to Putin. Now, Navalnaya was saying that Putin is effectively not to be considered as a normal world leader. She said that's where you've effectively got it wrong with the sanctions you've put in place. You're thinking of him like a normal leader. She says you need to think of him like a gangster. Effectively, what would you do with a mobster? You try to cut off his connections with criminality. You try to cut off his own personal financial links. And she says that's where you've got to be more bold. You've got to be more of an innovator, she said, like uh, Alexei Navalny. You go on to Kaya Kallas talking to you. Well, this is the Estonian prime minister right next to Russia. They have had to wake up to this threat, which they thought had become dormant. So they need to mob, they need a, a stronger rhetoric. That means talking about boots on the ground, which takes us, of course, then to Emmanuel Macron. Now, on the face of it, saying that he wants to keep the thought of putting soldiers in Ukraine, to many people, seems daft. I mean, the Germans, the British, the Americans have all pushed back against us. Olaf Scholz, the German chancellor, put out a video really kind of saying, what are we doing here? I think if you look a little deeper into what Macron is saying, it isn't just about soldiers. What he's saying is the West needs to be cleverer. It needs to be more innovative. It takes us back to what Yulia Navalnaya was saying, because he's not just talking about soldiers. He's talking about cyber warfare. He's talking about aggressive tactics, like the, the Russians having threatened uh, French uh, aircraft. He's talking about disinformation campaigns. What he is saying is that in this what he's referred to, what a lot have said, is a hybrid war. It's not enough to just talk about more and more shells. You need to be more creative, and in a way, you need to be more positive, more belligerent. And I think that is a thread that we are seeing today with these three high-profile individuals, a demand to the world, specifically to the West, probably specifically to NATO, to be a bit cuter, a bit cleverer, to look at your enemy, Vladimir Putin, put yourself in his brain and think, you're not just dealing with a normal person here, you're dealing with this one-off, autocratic head of a vast country with almost unlimited personal wealth. What would hurt him? Start thinking about that. Adam, thank you so much for all of your analysis there from Brussels. Well, let's go straight to Kiev now and speak with our John Sparks. And um, John, while all of these discussions and debates, of course, are, are taking place for the Ukrainians, the reality on the ground is this war continues and it is heading in the wrong direction. Uh, yes, I think Ukrainian forces are being, uh, they are being pushed back, uh, Zelensky said on uh, the weekend. 
uh, in a question that we posed to him, you know, look, you know, we don't have the ammunition, we don't have the equipment, we are going to have to move back 50 metres, 100 metres. That's the reality of the situation. And that is actually happening. They are losing territory at the moment. I mean, these discussions, Macron has, has it really kicked off, he's really initiated. This is what they want to hear. You know, this is, these are discussions that, that Zelensky and his team, they want people in the West to be talking about these things. And I think it's interesting that the Estonian uh, Prime Minister, the other leaders of the Baltic states, they formed a sort of hard core, haven't they, within NATO, lobbying for, for speedy, for comprehensive, for, for well-financed military assistance. And clearly, they are prepared to go even further. Interesting uh, there that Kallas and the Lithuanian Prime Minister, probably the only two leaders in in, uh, in Europe other than Macron saying, hey, look, we do need to think about this. We do need to think about putting troops on the ground in uh, Ukraine. Why are they saying that? It's about history. It's about, it's about personal experience as well. People in their 40s and above in the Baltic states, they lived under the Soviet Union. They don't want to, to go back to that. And they've also had to deal with interference and agitation from from Putin's Russia, often in the name or the guise of Russian-speaking minorities in those states. So, you know, they, they have a sympathy for what Ukraine is going through now because they've been through it themselves. As you say, they know uh, all too well uh, about what Russian aggression uh, means. I mean, uh, you know, there are now concerns that Putin has his eyes set on Moldova, for example. Yeah, and, and on this one, I think it's, it, it's a bit different, and I think we need to retain a sense of perspective on this, because I think ultimately what we're, we're talking about here is a, a power struggle within Moldova itself. Transnistria, it's a breakaway region within uh, Moldova itself. They have 1,500 troops. I know from my sources that they have a handful of Russian officers there. They've got some aging Soviet equipment. And, and the rest of them are basically men doing national service. Tensions have been rising in Moldova. That is because Moldova has, served, has signed the deep and comprehensive trade agreement with uh, the European Union. And that means that companies in Transnistria are now being required by Moldova to pay import and export duties amounting to about 16 million euros. That's what this is about. This is why... They convened at the Transnistrian Congress. This is why they asked for protection from Moscow, from the Russian parliament, uh, the Duma. It's about 16 million euros. At the moment, I think it's unlikely, highly unlikely, that Russia will do anything about it. John, uh, thank you so much for bringing us up to date there from Kiev. Well, let's bring in our studio guests this evening, journalist and author Rachel Shabby and Natasha Hausdorff, a barrister and legal uh, director at the UK Lawyers for Israel Charitable Trust. Thank you both for joining us. and We have so much to discuss uh, tonight. But, Natasha, I just want to uh, begin by sort of talking about the situation in Ukraine. The reality is that the Ukrainians are now outnumbered and they are in desperate need of money, uh, weapons and... Ukrainians. And it's a situation I don't think we can allow to continue. Um, it's now two years in. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, you cannot win a war in the middle and the West shouldn't be in a position uh, where it is allowing Russia to remain undefeated in Ukraine. There is a responsibility on the West uh, and the only way to finish this war is uh, for Russia to understand that it cannot win in Ukraine. And that responsibility, as I say, rests uh, with the West. Also, as we've been hearing on arms supply, uh, the level of production around the world uh, is uh, unsupportable and unforgivably low in these circumstances. It stems clearly from an assumption that uh, evil no longer exists. Uh, and two years into this, there's certainly a responsibility on Western powers to step up arms production, to support Ukraine, to be innov innovative, as we've been hearing, uh, and to take the threat from Russia uh, more seriously because, I mean, this is ancient proverb, right? show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. Russia and uh, its uh, supply from Iran, um, that is something that needs to be taken extremely seriously. In the same way, of course, um, Ukraine must defeat Russia, Israel must defeat Hamas. These are not wars that can be won in the middle. And other than that, we're just going to see a continuation uh, in both arenas. I mean, Rachel, the fact is that Russia today 
is very confident. When we hear what they have to say, I spoke to the Russian ambassador a couple of weeks ago. Their whole tone has changed. It's become very, very confident. They're bank banking on the fact that the willpower of the West will break. Absolutely, yeah, they're playing a long game. And they can see the Ukrainians somewhat in retreat and potentially not really able to regroup for a few months. I think there are a few other factors here. Obviously, um, Israel-Palestine and the war on Gaza is a drain on international focus funding and resources, and it's weird to hear. I mean, the Palestinians are the Ukrainians in this equation and not the other way around. Uh, no matter, I think one of the big issues, and it's something that you have been covering at Sky, is the degree to which uh, the West still is financially uh, in some way intertwined um, and facilitating Russia. So when we look at things like the report that you covered so well around, you know, the, the degree of components for weaponry. I mean, the mind boggles. Mind blowing. And then, you know, the, 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 the fact that European countries are still, you know, 40% dependent on oil and gas supplies from Russia. The fact that Russian oligarchs use the UK or the London more specifically as a laundromat for um, finances. All of these things can and have not been taken action for. And I suspect the reason is purely financial. So at some stage, you know, there has to be some decision made of what exactly the West's priorities are. Is it financial gain or is it actually uh, helping Ukraine in this situation? Well, we are going to move to the Middle East uh, after the break, so do stay with us. You're watching The World with me, Yalda Hakeem. Still to come, Sky News gains special access to a prison once run by Ecuador's most feared drug cartels. We'll have uh, the second of our chief correspondent, Stuart Ramsey's special reports as the governor of a city which was once a no-go zone claims his residents are now free. Plus, the call from journalists, including myself, to allow free, unfettered access to the Gaza Strip to report on the Israel-Hamas war. Stay with us. travel from up here where they spend the summer and then they go down to their breeding pond down there and they've been doing this for year after year after tens and hundreds of years but we've put a road in the way and so an awful lot gets squashed on the roads now and it's awful you see them on the roads they're just awful and there's so many that, that get squashed so what we've got is a tow patrol and we're out here with our high vis with our bucket and with our torch in the evenings and we literally just pick up the toads carry them across the road so they don't get squashed when it's it's, a, it's when it's damp evenings it's particularly that's really a good time for toads so damp evenings and when it's a little bit warm so when it's quite mild as well they particularly like to go at that, that sort of time so if you do see a tow patrol sign around that's the time not to go down those roads and to go just go another way and um, sometimes we can get we can get hundreds um, sometimes a really busy night you can get hundreds of toads so far this year at this patrol we've saved 1192 toads so actually physically pick them up take them across the road and last year for tow patrols all around the country they, they saved 115,000 toads so there's about over 200 patrols around the country all doing the same thing all on wet evenings in february and they're picking up toads and they've saved 115,000 so it's it's a lot and I think it's really important to do. It just gives them a fighting chance.
Welcome back. This week, we've been on the front line of Ecuador's battle to destroy the country's drug cartels. Now Sky News has gained special access to a prison notorious for holding some of the most dangerous and influential drug lords. After years of bloodshed, the Ecuadorian government is desperately trying to crack down on the reign of terror that's gripped the nation for decades. In January, the president declared a state of emergency lasting 60 days after a well-known gang leader escaped from prison. Many jails in the country are controlled by gangs, but in the city of Esmeraldas, the military has broken that stranglehold. Leaders of one gang, known as the Big Tigers, were using the city's main jail as its headquarters. But in January, the military stormed the facility in an operation that took a year to plan. The army has allowed in our chief correspondent, Stuart Ramsey. Uh, here is his special report. <laughs> Just weeks ago, Sky News walking into this prison would have been actually impossible. Ecuador's gangs were in complete control, were armed and occasionally visited their cells just to sleep. The transformation at the hands of the country's military is astonishing. And these are the most serious criminals. This prison in the city of Esmeraldas was actually the operating headquarters of the gang Los Tiguerones, the Big Tigers. The Tigers are behind bars now. This is the maximum security wing uh, of the prison. There's just over 1,400 uh, men here. Um, what's interesting, 95% of them are in prison for gang-related crimes or terrorist-related crimes, as it's now been designated by the government. The military says they'd planned the takeover of the prison for a year. They were just waiting for the orders to move in. It's, uh, it's totally different right now, because right now we have the, the control here. Uh, before, uh, the inmates got the control. Taking control of the prisons is widely regarded as the key to cracking the problems caused by the gangs and the cartels. Taking them off the streets, imposing discipline. including instructing them to chant slogans praising their country, is all part of the strategy to weaken the gang's hold of the barrios. Whether it will work or not is far from certain. Outside of prison, it's beach party time in Ecuador. A party that still needs protection, though. What can only be described as bizarre is the presence of heavily armed marines patrolling the beaches and beach bars to the sound of booming Latin American pop music. Just a few weeks ago, car bombs and murders were so common here that the beaches, bars and restaurants were empty. The gangs had taken over, but now, at the very least, they've gone underground or to jail. Stuart Ramsey, Sky News, Esmeraldas. Ecuador. This is The World with me, Yalda Hakim. Next up, I'll be joined by our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, on the call by journalists across the industry for access to the Gaza Strip.
Welcome back. Our panel is still here. Rachel Shabby and Natasha Hausdorff. More from them in a moment. First, though, we're going to talk about Gaza. Sky News, along with journalists from other broadcasters, is calling for unfettered access to the Strip in order to report on the war. Entry for the media has been all but impossible, without the permission and supervision of the Israel Defence Forces. Earlier, I spoke with our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, one of the signatories. I just wanted to first of all say thank you so much for, for driving this, for, for leading it, because frankly, as journalists and, you know, as someone like yourself who has had decades of experience doing this, we need to bear witness. We need to be able to see and we need to be able to report from the ground when something like this happens. Absolutely right, Yalda. And to be honest, it wasn't uh, difficult getting all my um, senior colleagues in rival organisations on board on this. Very, very easy because everyone is in the same boat and everyone feels the same way. And there's a long list of really distinguished, respected journalists that have managed to get together. And that was only the broadcasting group. I mean, I didn't even bring in uh, people from the newspapers who are now desperate to get, get their voices in because everyone who's a, um, a, a foreign correspondent worth their salt wants to be reporting from inside Gaza right now. We want to be able to find out and track down those hostages. We want to be able to find out if Hamas leaders are hiding in tunnels. We want to know if uh, civilians are being put forward as human shields. We want to find out the truth. Indeed, and yet uh, we are blocked from entering. The IDF says it's because of security. I mean, there is uh, obviously a security and a risk in every single war that any foreign journalist or any journalist covers. There are inherent risks. And that's why it's important that so many very experienced, decades and decades of experience in amongst the signatories that signed the letter are on that letter because they all have huge amount of experience in some of the most hostile environments around the world. Uh, some have been injured, many have been taken hostage. Uh, there is so much experience amongst that, that group of people. We are well aware of the risks. And we also have the luxury of being backed up by large media organisations who do their utmost to keep us all safe as much as possible. We're aware of the risks, we've taken them before and we're prepared to take them again. And Alex, of course, you remain on the road. You've been reporting on this story since the very beginning, since October the 7th. And what are you now hoping will happen? What are you hoping this letter and, and perhaps some of the, the pressure now will do? Do you think that we will get the access that we're looking for? Well, what uh, shocked me is that many people think we have already got access to Gaza. Uh, even amongst um, my fellow journalists in Iraq and in northeast Syria, where I've just been, they, they think there is access. There very definitely is not access to anyone who was not already inside Gaza on October the 7th. And that is a huge gap. It leaves a massive vacuum of misinformation, disinformation, maliciously or... Uh, subconsciously, we need to be on the ground. Remember also that any large uh, news event, even if it's the Olympics or the Labour Party conference, the Conservative Party conference, usually sends a rotor of different reporters covering Ukraine. We had a rotor. Every media organisation had a, a teams of, of, of uh, journalists going in and refreshing and changing because the Wars are exhausting mentally and physically to cover. I only have to spend a couple of nights on the floor in a, in a shelter in Ukraine with bombs falling all, ra all around with my crew to feel utterly degraded. Can you imagine how the journalists already in there must feel after nearly five months? And there is a really high number of journalists, Palestinian journalists, because no other journalist is in, who've been killed during this war. We need to get fresh people in there, fresh journalists in there. This is a monumentally big world event, which is having ripple effects throughout the Middle East and globally. We should be on the ground reporting it. Otherwise, there's gonna be this continued suspicion and doubt and confusion about what is right and what is not right. We need to be able to prove or disprove a lot of these allegations, very serious allegations of war crimes, and more serious one of genocide. Whilst we're not in there, these uh, doubts and suspicions will continue. 
as you say, heroic uh, work by our colleagues who are in Gaza, who were impacted personally by their families. And, and we're really grateful that you have uh, now driven this and hopefully it will bring about some change because we do need to bear witness and report, as you say, from the ground. Alex, thank you so much. That was Alex Crawford speaking to me there from Erbil in Iraq, where she's currently on assignment. Well, earlier today, our Middle East correspondent, Alastair Bunkle, put the question about access into Gaza to an IDF spokesperson. There is access, there is abundance of reporting coming out from the Gaza Strip. Um, from our perspective, there are security challenges on the ground that are creating difficult conditions for that, Alistair. From our perspective, we need to facilitate your work in the best possible capability while enabling the ability to continue to, op to operate. Uh, of course, there, it's not a, a, just an Israeli decision at this time. And we've seen international journalists that have gone in from CNN, from the Egyptian side, and there's also something that needs to be taken into consideration. Peter Lerner there. Well, let's bring in our panel, Rachel and Natasha. Natasha, I'll come to you first. I mean, journalists should be given access. It's the whole point of it is that we bear witness and see what's going on so we can report for ourselves. We've just heard confirmation in that interview that journalists have had levels of access. We've seen Jeremy with Bowen reporting. IDF. Yes, we've seen Jeremy Bowen reporting embedded with the IDF, uh, other journalists. Um, clearly, the issue is a security situation. Israel suffered uh, two fatalities only this morning amongst the soldiers that were operating in the north of Gaza, um, which is, you know, we were told had been cleared of Hamas, of course, um, long before that. So I think it's important not to underestimate the intense challenges that Israel's facing, unprecedented challenges, we're told by military experts, in terms of the levels of urban armed conflict and the way that Hamas has spent the last 16 years embedding itself in civilian infrastructure. I mean, that's clearly not a safe environment for any journalist to be but reporting. As a in. journalist, I know that embeds, I've done them with the Americans, I've done them with the Afghan forces, with the Iraqi forces your control to a, to a level. And, mm. and I think that's part of the point of what journalists are trying to say. And the critical issue here, and I absolutely agree with this element of it, what we have had from the Palestinian journalists on the ground so far, unfortunately, is parroting Hamas propaganda. Um, nowhere is that more uh, apparent than in the casualty figures that are constantly being put out. At least we've had, latterly, clarification that they come from the Hamas-controlled Palestinian Ministry of well, Health. The, the, the US president actually made a point and, and said just last week that 28,000 people were killed. That was the US president. Well, the State Department I think said that as well. I think that's extremely problematic when those numbers are reliant only, and they're not uh, independently verified, reliant on uh, hamas control. Well, I think that the US president wouldn't be parroting well, the... Um, but please, the Rachel, one, if you wanted to jump in. I think just that's just a yeah. willful misunderstanding of how journalism works, frankly. And I think this is a perfect sweet spot for the Israeli army. They, I remember they first did this... Uh, in the 2008 war on Gaza when I was based in the region and they banned all journalists apart from the ones that were already there. Um, the Palestinian journalists in Gaza, as you and your colleague Alex Crawford described, are doing an incredible job um, trying to get the truth out to the world while their own families and sometimes their colleagues are being killed. Um, is... Does the IDF have a point, though? It's a security issue. No, that's not their decision to make. That's your decision to make. That's your risk and your organization's risk. That's your decision. What Israel wants is to carry out these operations in the dark, number one, and number two, facilitate the kind of nonsense that Natasha is coming out with, which is, oh, we can't possibly verify any of this. Well, let's we go down know. on those casualty let's figures. Let's have a look at moment. those casualty no, figures. Just let's... give me yelled at. Okay, I've, I've just been accused ahead. of speaking nonsense. Those figures that even Biden has now been re repeating, utterly unverified, even if we look at the... You 20... would think the Americans would well, get their me. intelligence May I? There, there are yeah, three points to draw out here. The first point is uh, the inflation that we have seen. And there are there is independent analysis on the basis of open source to, uh, to, to go into that. Um, if I use one example on the 17th of October, the um, al Ahli hospital strike that uh, the international media was accusing Israel of having conducted, well, that has been utterly debunked. It was a Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket that fell in the car park. But that 500... Uh, uh, casualty jump on the 17th of October has never been revised. It's just one example. So the veracity of those figures is impossible to determine at this stage. But there are other two, two critical issues of missing information. The first one is who are these people that they say are making up these casualty figures? Because Hamas does not distinguish between combatants and civilians. The what IDF know, has clearly what stated... What we know is that there are a lot of children... Well, the Americans, the UK, yes. Israel's staunchest allies are now saying 
too many civilians are being killed. Let's just clarify, Israel has said, and it has verified this, it knows that it has killed uh, nearly 12,000 terrorists. That is not accounted for in the Hamas figures. And the other thing that is missing is how these people died. Because we so know that Hamas... The... Sorry, I'm going to just bring in Rachel. Sorry, go ahead. This is a willful misunderstanding of how journalism and verification and sourcing works. When we take figures from the Gaza Health Ministry, it is because those figures have checked out in the past. They checked out in 2008, they checked out in 2014, they checked out in 2012. The Gaza Health Ministry is the most, uh, the best able to get those figures from the hospitals, from the morgues. When those figures were disputed months ago, it very diligently... The US president disputed them. He disputed them. They wrote out a list, 212 pages, names, ID numbers, which Israel has because Israel controls the registry. We use those sources for the same reason that we use any other source. The because final they... element of missing Hang information on, I haven't finished here yet. is... Haven't finished. Well, neither had Sorry. I. I had Forgive not me. finished. The final element you of missing going information to more... here... You're going to throw I'm more sorry. shade the and nonsense. The final element of missing information here is how these people have died. We know that Hamas has been shooting its own civilians. We know that they have been bombing fleeing civilians. And we know Who that Hamas and Gaza? Palestinian Islamic Jihad rockets fired towards Israel are falling short in the Gaza Strip. I'm just going to... Uh, go ahead. We use, those, we use those sources because we use sources that check out. The Gaza Health Ministry, along with other sources that we use from Gaza, have consistently checked out. That's how basic journalism works. I'm sorry that you keep throwing shade on that. It's really insulting. Number two... Who is dropping the bombs on Gaza? Which country, which government has dropped in the first few months of the war the equivalent of three nuclear bombs well, on I Gaza? To to that no, directly. you may not, because I have not finished. Sorry, no, we've, we we've literally talking, got 30 we are seconds. I'll just about Palestinian Sorry, women and children. Tens and thousands of women and, and children be who are being yeah. killed, yeah. maimed, orphaned, terrorised and tortured. And let's that be is clear happening about because who is Israeli army who is bombs okay, are, I'll just are obliterating you... houses and every sign of infrastructure in Gaza. You cannot blame anyone else for that. Any international Sorry. lawyer or military expert worth their salt will be confirming that throughout every previous conflict, Israel has not only complied with the laws of armed conflict on proportionality, on distinction, on necessity and on precision targeting and precaution against civilian casualties, but has gone way above. And there is no reason to suggest that this time this, is... in this particular instance they have? If we look at the figures for other armed conflicts, uh, the average global figure that the United Nations puts out for urban armed conflicts is a d very disturbing nine civilians to every one combatant killed. Well, the Israeli figures check out at more or less one to one now, which is unprecedented in the history of urban conflict. And it is testament well, to the targeted strikes that Israel is conducting. But the final happens, missing piece of information... Uh, I'm so sorry. Israeli sources have, themselves have never, admitted that they, are not, that they have changed the laws of targeting. I have never, you have Israeli sources telling Israeli the opportunity newspapers to finish that they the raised point. the number of permissible that's civilian deaths. Wait, 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 that's Israeli sources saying that. Forgive me. Okay, the final element of final missing point, information is the how these civilians have died. Because whereas Israel strikes are precise and targeted, the Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad rockets that fall short in the Gaza Strip kill Palestinians okay, indiscriminately. I'm, I'm going to have to actually we... go to the ad break, but I, I will come back. We'll keep you here. This is The World with me, Yalda Hakim. After the break, we'll cross over to Washington, where a household name in US politics has announced he will be stepping down. At 82 years old, we'll discuss how the absence of Mitch McConnell one of the Republican Party's most prominent supporters of Ukraine will play out in the Senate. And tonight on Sky News at 10, an apology at last as police in Scotland admit they have failed women as a man is finally brought to justice for the murder of Emma Caldwell nearly two decades ago. We'll have a special report from our chief correspondent inside one of Ecuador's notorious prisons and we'll hear from the families still fighting for compensation for the infected blood scandal. That's coming up at 10 o'clock.
We've got your Sunday mornings covered. From the front page and the sounds of the streets to the voices of the people who make the major calls and big picture politics beyond Westminster. We'll put you at the heart of our story. A new start to Sunday. I'm ready. Are you? Join me, Trevor Phillips, Sunday mornings on Sky News. I'm Dan Whitehead and I'm Sky's West of England correspondent. I'm Katie Spencer and I'm Sky News' arts and entertainment correspondent. We help you to understand the world with us. I'm Adam Parsons, I'm Sky's Europe correspondent based here in Brussels. We take you to the heart of stories that shape our world. I'm Lisa Dowd and I'm one of Sky's Midlands correspondents. The reason I do this job is because you never know where it's going to lead. Welcome back. Next, a major announcement in the United States. Uh, Mitch McConnell, one of the Republican Party's most influential figures for decades, has announced he's standing down in November. The Republican leader of the U.S. Senate, who is 82, says he knows it's time to stand down. Have a listen. One of life's most underappreciated talents is to know when it's time to move on to life's next chapter. So I stand before you today, Mr. President, and my colleagues to say this will be my last term as Republican leader of the Senate. Mitch McConnell there. Well, he's only a year younger than uh, McConnell, but today President Biden was deemed fit for duty following his annual physical. Here he was joking with reporters afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's bring in uh, our US correspondent, uh, Mark Stone. Mark, uh, we just heard there uh, Joe Biden joking, saying he, he looks, uh, do, do people think he looks too young? But, but let's first of all talk about Mitch McConnell, because it really is an end of an era for him. It is, I should say, incidentally, that, that on President Biden, and I do wonder whether uh, Mitch McConnell had a bit of a, a dig at Biden in saying you need to know when it's time to step down. On, on Biden, um, he, he had a medical today and the statement's just been released from the physician to the president. I mean, it details a few minor issues, a, a skin lesion, so, some, um, some uh, sleep difficulties, but, you know, the, the, 
the top line to, or the bottom line for any, anyone concerned about his health, President Biden is a healthy, active, robust 81-year-old who remains fit to successfully execute the duties of the presidency. Uh, that uh, is a clear counter to all those who've wondered if, if he is, as, uh, as one Justice Department official says, uh, a forgetful elderly uh, man. That's the president. Um, you're right, though, Mitch McConnell, well, well his, his health has really been on show recently. He paused for a very long time in the middle of a speech not that long ago. He's a year older than Biden. Um, uh, he, he is an elderly man, uh, and he has decided it's, decided it's time to go. I think, yes, he'll leave a huge hole uh, in the right of, of American politics. He, he kind of, I mean, he's, he's been around for so long. I was looking back. He was first, first arrived on Capitol Hill when President Reagan uh, was president. And I think Reagan politics has been his guardrail throughout. He's sort of rided through the undulations of, uh, of, of Republican politics uh, as it's gone one way or the other, um, from the Tea Party, the, the, the Bushes, Reagan himself, uh, and of course, Trump too. Uh, and I suppose he really represented the old guard of the Republican Party, providing those traditional Republican guardrails. Uh, now, with him gone, if Trump wins the presidency, well, you can imagine that a Trumpian uh, alternative to him uh, will be in place uh, as minority or majority leader in the Senate. That will provide significant changes. No question. Mark, uh, thank you so much for that update. Well, that's all for tonight's programme. We started with the question of how to handle Vladimir Putin. The man in the White House will arguably play a bigger role than anyone else in that challenge. Time will tell if that's Joe Biden or Donald Trump. That's it from the programme and the team here tonight. We'll be back again at 9pm tomorrow night. Next, the news at 10.